Welcome back to Psychology Applied to Work. This is lecture 34, Health at Work. All right, last lecture, lecture 33, we started chapter 12 and talked about safety at work, uh, specifically safety statistics in the U.S., how workplace conditions affect safety at work, how personal behavior, personal factors affect safety at work, Accident prevention, um, uh, how, organ how organizations um, put things in place to reduce the rate of accidents, and then workplace violence. And today we'll finish chapter 12, talking about health at work. And so we will talk about alcohol and drug use at work. We'll talk about the prevention, and the detection, and the reduction of that alcohol and um, drug use and abuse at work. Uh, we'll talk about how computers uh, are, relate to physical health, and we'll talk about um, prevention of health-related issues from computers. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, exposure hazards at work. All right, let's get into health at work, and specifically alcohol and drugs. Um, and alcohol, drugs, and accidents, and their prevention. Um, I'm sorry, I'm giving you an overview of what we'll be talking about, a little more detail. So we'll talk about uh, also employee assistance programs, and then when we talk about computer use and health, we'll talk about musculoskeletal pain a little bit, repetitive strains, sedentariness, and eye strain. And then when we talk about exposure, uh, we'll talk about some of the illnesses that can come from them, um, and those include toxins and, uh, and injuries from exposures that can take a long time, and we'll talk about the role of the EPA. All right, now we'll get into alcohol and drug use at work. So working under the influence uh, um, shouldn't be a big surprise that that can be a safety hazard. Uh, it's especially true of certain professions. So like if you're a heavy equipment operator, if you're air traffic controller, you know, your healthcare worker, um, your vigilance uh, can mean people's lives. And being impaired uh, can affect your judgment and can affect your, uh, what you're paying attention to, it can affect your cognition, and that can result in uh, uh, um, injuries and fatalities for you and for others. Um, also being hungover, you know, being, un, being both drunk as well, or, or on drugs, and as well as, as coming off of them in a way that ends up with a, a, a hangover, can lead to errors, and those errors can also lead to accidents. Uh, from a statistic standpoint for alcohol and drugs at work, it's difficult to comply, most, uh, to compile, mostly because very few admit to fireable behavior. Yeah, and, and certainly there's incidents that happen. People show up at work and they're clearly just high as a kite, you know, or they're drunk as a skunk, um, or there's an or, uh, there, there's an, uh, an accident that resulted in a drug test, and and um, there and there's data that then come from that. But um, when people have errors at work and other things. Um, or, or, or uh, the, 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 the correlating between whether that was alcohol or drugs uh, is lost often because it just simply isn't reported. Um, but from surveys, uh, in 2012, 2,000 workers were surveyed. And just as an example here, about two-thirds, almost two-thirds said that if they wanted to bring alcohol into work, they could. It'd be easy. And, and a slightly smaller amount, but, but a sizable amount, 59%, said, yeah, if I wanted to bring drugs into work, it'd be easy. Almost a quarter uh, of the people surveyed said they had witnessed uh, co-workers uh, using alcohol, and 13% they had witnessed um, co-workers using drugs. Um, looking at uh, some other data from 2017 of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Services Administration, just sort of looking at broad uh, data, 50% um, of adults dr uh, a drink, and of those, 25% have uh, said that they at least meet the definition of binge drinking, and 6 to 10% drank heavily just in the last month, and 10% used illicit drugs in the past month. Uh, with regard to some uh, data uh, associated with drugs and accidents, uh, people who were involved in accidents that were then uh, te uh, drug tested um, were 4.45 times more likely to have opioids in their system than somebody that was just sort of randomly tested. Yet, uh, in another study, they found no association between workplace 
accidents and harmful alcohol consumption. So it doesn't mean there aren't incidences where somebody was drunk at work and and ran rammed their delivery truck into something. But uh, as a as an overall broad association, it's it's very difficult to to, to make broad statements about uh, alcohol and accidents. Okay, so uh, what uh, do um, organizations typically do to try to prevent uh, alcohol and drug use at work? Um, one of them is testing. So it's common. Um, it's becoming a little less common now that uh, uh, culture is shifting. Certainly it's shifted immensely around marijuana, but it's certain parts of the country. I mean, it's shifting about all sorts of drugs. Um, and, and so companies are, some of them are reconsidering to what extent do they do their drug tests beforehand. But there's liability associated with that. Uh, if, you, if you bring in a, a known drug user uh, because um, they, uh, um, you tested them and they found that they, they had drugs in their system and then you hired them and then they had an accident, somebody got hurt, that's actually going to be used against you, your organization. So that's where the drug tests usually started in the first place for pre-screening of new hires. And it's very difficult to get the lawyers uh, of organizations to agree that it'd be a good idea to remove them, but um, some of that is happening. Uh, but uh, drug tests for pre-hire as a, as, a, as a screen are called the drug screen. It's, it's still uh, very common. Um, another common time to do testing is when there's reasonable suspicion, which is basically, hey, um, uh, this guy looks high. <laughs> um, and there's what's called reasonable suspicion training. Uh, um, I've had that uh, a few different occasions, uh, in, in the, and it can be quite elaborate. And it, you need to be you need to document as managers or supervisors that you've definitely had reasonable suspicion training, so that if you go and say, "I think one of my people here is is drunk," uh, and then you use that to to insist on the person getting a um, drug or alcohol test, you know, and if they refuse, that can be grounds for being fired. Um, but what's critical there is that you can you can document the, your reasonable suspicion, and that the company can document that you've been trained in uh, to assess uh, people, so that your your judgment of reasonable suspicion matches what you've been trained for. And then when there's workplace accidents, it's a common um, common um, time to uh, in, instigate a drug test. And then some places do random testing. And then it's just generally, as I've said before, it's difficult to draw conclusions about the effectiveness of some of these things uh, because it's difficult to draw the connections. Um, it's, but it's, I mean, very few people are out there saying that um, being high or drunk at work isn't a problem because, I mean, it just on its face, it's a problem. Um, it's just difficult to, uh, to really disambiguate it. And so then it's exactly what, how much is it contributing to rates? And then some of that is because companies are very vigilant about keeping people away from their jobs if they're, if they're obviously drunk or high. So uh, it would seem that a lot of the times, uh, you know, it, people are, are, are more um, um, clandestine and, and maybe they're less obviously impaired. Uh, and then that data doesn't get re reported. And so uh, um, because that data doesn't get reported, you don't really see which way it's going, so it's difficult to assess how effective your prevention programs are. But nonetheless, they, they, they're they considered very important things by most organizations. And, you know, there's just a lot of confounding variables that make it difficult. And then uh, from a, a prevention and certainly more of a reduction standpoint, um, most organizations have some kind of employee assistance program. And, and often these are, these are services that are offered um, a large companies might have their own program, but it's 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 much more common for a company to basically have a relationship with a third party, and often that third party is a not not for profit organization, um, or multiple ones depending upon the kind of assistance. In this case, it's you know, it, it's um, for drug and alcohol abuse, but there's other things um, that employee assistance programs can can help people with. It's really any time that employees are having personal challenges, um, you know, such as drug and alcohol abuse. Um, that might be negatively affecting them at, at work or at home. I mean, because if you're if you're affected really badly at home, that often spills over into into your engagement at work. Um, and then if you're directly affected at work, I mean, that that's that's on its face something that's going to affect your pro your productivity. Um, and so EAPs uh, are extremely common. Um, and uh, um, sending somebody or referring somebody to a, an, e an EAP program because of suspicion that they might have an alcohol or drug problem is actually extraordinarily common in terms of what what, what, EA, 
when EAP, EAPs get used. But you know, it can be done for mental health reasons, um, uh, or, or I mean, in some cases, you could have an EAP program that's that's really um, broad and it could offer like even financial, uh, like financial planning advice and, and those sorts of things. But um, uh, probably the most common thing is the drug and alcohol. Um, okay, let's talk about computers uh, and. Uh, um, you know, they're the ubiquitous part of our culture. Uh, you, you're, if you're watching this, you're staring at one uh, or your phone, uh, just like I am uh, on my computer. Um, and uh, there's a lot of associated issues with it. I mean, certainly muscul musculoskeletal pain. A lot of this is posture and just not moving around and just being, being stuck in a particular position that isn't necessarily what you've optimally evolved for. So head and neck and upper back um, um, uh, issues are common with computer use. And a similar finding uh, with uh, endless mobile use. I mean, you can, you can just, you know, you, you can be slunched down in your computer and how many people are just sitting there down on their phone all the time. And, um, that's, uh, we, we were now doing that for hours and hours and hours. And then there's repetitive strains and a lot of occupations uh, um, have a repetitive strain risk and probably the thing that people are most familiar with. Um, it seems like it's less so. It seems like we've got, organizations have gotten a, uh, a handle on, on, on at least some of the excesses of this, but it's carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, which is deals with the um, uh, your nerve that runs inside your wrist, and uh, and it can be quite debilitating. Um, and it's associated with many profe uh, uh, professions, you know, meat cutters and, and certain types of carpenters, even musicians, you know, you're playing guitar all the time. Um, uh, you're uh, if you're a meat cutter all the time, and where where are, are you constantly doing actions where you're repeating the same thing again and again? Um, that might be putting um, um, stress on your, your your tendons and your muscles that can then swell a little bit, and they can actually start impinging on nerves, and uh, it can be quite bad. Um, Meta-analysis, like uh, studies looking at all sorts of studies, they have found that it's a fairly minor risk now for keyboard and mouse use, and and perhaps. Um, uh, I remember, you, you know, I'm old enough where computers were um, not ubiquitous uh, when you when, when I went to uh, initially went to work. It was you often would share a computer in some cases, uh, but I also remember mice that were a lot harder to harder to use than today's mice, and that might be something to do with it. But I don't I don't know. But mo modern mice, and modern and modern keyboards don't seem to be that associated, and so it's considered minor risk for repetitive strains. And then there's general just sedentariness. Um, you know, and, and just <laughs> sitting on your butt is is bad for you. Um, and that actually is associated with cardiovascular disease and diabetes and even cancer. Um, and a lot of computer use is correlated with sedentary behaviors. Uh, and then, uh, then there's eye strain, of course. Um, and just staring at a screen for hours and hours on end, it can not be good for your eyes. And that can lead to, you know, just tired eyes. You just, you know, your, your, your lids feel heavy and you just don't want to, um, it just it hurts kind of to even stare at the screen and you need to just take a break um, but also just dry eyes and itchy eyes and uh, burning eyes um, and that can actually lead to some long-term uh, uh, long-term problems it certainly can affect your productivity if, 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 if um, you constantly having to blink and look away from the screen um, and the, <laughs> the long-term impacts of all of our phones man um, and uh, you, you, I know that uh, people in this class are of all sorts of, of, of ages, you know, but I think it's safe, safe to say that the average age is associated with the average age of an undergrad. So the um, ma majority of you uh, are substantially younger than me. Um, but there's a younger generation, younger than you yet, um, that has never not known screens. And you're, you're probably at that. Th those of you who are um, traditional uh, uh, undergrads, um, um, you've probably been, a, been a near a screen most of your life, um, but it's, uh, it, it would seem to me that the um, current babies coming up now are like going to be glued. And we just don't have any idea what the long-term impacts of all sorts of stuff on, on overall development. Because as you're going through developmental stages uh, as an organiz organism, and, and obviously some major step changes are things like puberty, but just when you're going from a uh, baby to an adult... Um, you know, if you're always focused on something close, hunched over and activating your thumbs or whatever, um, that's wiring your brain, it's wiring your physiology, and we don't, we don't really know uh, where, that, where that's going. Um, 
It might not be terrible, um, you know, but it probably has some consequences to it that that uh, you know that people will have to deal with late, later on in life, and and uh, and it might not just be you know your upper back is stiff, but we'll we'll see. Okay, so what are some things that organizations do uh, and that people can do to try to prevent health-related issues associated with computers? So for musculo, uh, musculoskeletal pains and repetitive strains, uh, there's some recommendations. So in the, the book, um, the NIOSH is a, a, a federal organization. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Um, there's table 12.4 in the book you guys should look at. Um, and then, you know, your whole placement of your computer and your system, you know, I'm, I'm staring at a thing here that has multiple monitors and, and a laptop and, and keyboards. And of course, this is set up with the streaming deck. Um, but uh, um, placement, how far away is, are your screens? Uh, um, are you, you know, what, what's your posture? Uh, um, and all of those things. Configuring your system to reduce... Um, pain uh, and to reduce repetitive strain is key. Uh, being physically fit, you know, having a good core strength. I mean, be, just uh, having excellent posture. Um, you know, not not just being motionless. And uh, and uh, from a sedentary standpoint, I mean, having a stand up desk um, or having a desk that goes from sit or stand. Um, you know, there's uh, um, desks that uh, raise and lower. Um, where where I work. Uh, it, that's identified as as uh, um, you know, well worth it, and so if you ask for a stand-up desk, you'll get one, um, because you know you, your health and your, uh, is associated with your productivity, and so it's it's well worth the, the money uh, of organization to pay for that typically, uh, and then just taking breaks, knowing when when you've been staring too long or hunched over too long. Um, and then from an eye strain standpoint, it, you know, get, making sure the brightness is 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 okay not not too bright not too much contrast not so dim that you're that you're sitting and straining be aware that the brighter it is the your your iris is your pupils responding um uh what font ch size you know what what zoom level you're looking at, at documents or your emails at um the overall height and distance of the screen uh for some of you i mean these are important things for me i'm a little older and for for those of you who are not you might not think this is that big of a deal um, but it actually is, and the the, the, the less accumulated strain you have uh, overall, the better. Um, so I mean, take all these take all these things uh, seriously. Um, and then you know, just blink more uh, from an eye standpoint. I mean, it is it's really weird, but when you're just like looking at your any a long email or a document or or whatever, I mean, there's this tendency to just sort of stare. Um, <laughs> and and not blink and then the blinking is a it's a vital thing i mean it, it uh, um uh, besides it just, I mean, you, it's lubrication uh, but it's also like a little mini break um and then on that take regular breaks and try to avoid glare you know bright light coming in from one spot that that makes it so you're kind of squinting and 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 straining um and then uh, we'll talk about uh, uh the last part here is uh, hazards exposure hazards at work um so we talked about NIOSH, uh, um, and that's within the CDC, and we've mentioned OSHA, that's within the Department of Labor, and then the EPA, and most of you are familiar with the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, they've identified many exposure hazards at work. Um, NIOSH um, is the National Institute of Occupational S Safety and Health, and their job as a, as a federal agency is to research the causes and to research and, 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 and communicate the prevention of accidents and diseases in the workplace. OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and they're there to ensure safe work practices are established and enforced. OSHA is the one that's going to come in and say, you have to do this. You have to have these engineering controls in place. You have to have these administrative controls in place. If you have a really workplace accident and then somebody gets killed, OSHA's there. And they're like, hey, we're documenting this, we're investigating this. And if we find that you had a shoddy operation and you didn't have proper training and proper controls, we can, we can find you. Whereas NIOSH is, is, is sort of is an information gathering, a research place, and then provide you with helpful information. Now, the EPA has identified that there's 16,000 things that would be called a chemical substance that, uh, that are different ones that are regularly used in workplaces. Of them, 150 are known to be neurotoxins. Um, that's kind of spooky. And then there's this growing use of uh, nanoparticles, uh, which are, you know, things so small that sometimes they can get through cell membranes. 
And uh, it's really not, uh, I mean, there's certain types of nanoparticles that have like certain types of metals in them that have known toxicity. But other types of nanoparticles that are bi built upon chemistries that don't have known toxicity, they're still unknown of what their long-term effects are because uh, certain nano synthesized artificial nanoparticles can move through the body. And they can pass through membranes, literally cell membranes, um, and uh, uh, there's lots of different types of ones, and, and it's just sort of a, 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 a relatively unknown area. And then um, uh, it's estimated there that there are 13 million workers uh, that are, have a daily exposure to uh, assorted chemicals that aren't currently regulated, but that those chemicals don't really have a known safety threshold. I mean, there's lots of chemicals that, if you look at history, um, people thought were perfectly safe because nobody ever got sick from, the, from using them all day long. It was only after using them for like five years or 20 years that people started to see, oh, crap, this is actually shortening people's lives. This, this, the, the, the rates of cancer associated with this. I mean, they could think about things like asbestos uh, or, or the exposure of, uh, of, of particulate and soot. And things that used to be in, in, in more dirty uh, um, diesel exhaust, if you're, if you're exposed to that again and again, in some cases accumulated over years, those can be very bad. And, and, and there's lots that have been identified. Um, but uh, there's still a lot of chemicals that uh, we might find uh, uh, increase your risk over time and that, it, and that the government might want to put in uh, um, minimally recommendations and po possibly hard, re hard regulations associated with how much exposure a worker can have. Um, but there's just a lot of them that, uh, that haven't had their um, safe threshold established. And uh, both NIOSH and OSHA were created in 1970. And since that time, um, since the creation of those two organizations, one, NIOSH is, is sort of research and prevention, sort of information and sharing, and OSHA is, is really more the enforcement and reporting agency. Um, since then, since 1970, deaths on the job in the U.S. have reduced from thir um, 13, 38 per day to 14 per day. That's still, uh, that's still a lot, um, but it's a good, good reduction uh, to, to show that these, that these uh, agencies, as well as state agencies, as well as general awareness and those sorts of things, as well as self-regulation where companies try to do smarter things because they want to keep their people safe as well. Um, and then accidents as a rate um, have went from 10.9 per, per 100 workers um, uh, per year um, so if you have 100 workers in a given year, about 11 of them are going to get involved in an accident. That has gone down to 2.8 um, in, uh, in 2017. And then another, another thing from exposure uh, is uh, the, there's the American Academy of, of Asthma. And they estimate that 15% of, of people who have asthma actually have acquired that uh, due to chronic workplace exposures and such that asthma... Um, is, uh, is the most common work-related respiratory disorder. Okay, that's it. Um, and that's it for, uh, for Chapter 12. Let's recap what we talked about. So we talked about health at work, and specifically um, alcohol and drug use at work, as well as its prevention and detection and reduction. And we talked about computer use and its association with uh, physical health. And we talked about how to prevent some of those health-related issues uh, involving computers, and then finally we talked about um, exposure, mostly chemical exposure at work, as, as well as some, the roles of some federal agencies. And next uh, lecture, lecture 35, is another bonus video lecture. Um, this one is about strategic human resources. All right, we'll see you in the next video.